You know how when you have a pack of batteries at home, <laughs> and you're not exactly sure how old they are, but you just assume it's a new pack, so the batteries in them are good? So they open up a new pack of batteries today, and they give me two, and I didn't even look at what this was doing, but the batteries in the pack, you can get rid of them. <laughs> so let's start again. It's good to be in worship this morning. My name is Andy Morgan, one of the pastors here, and uh, it is good to be able to gather uh, together. And, uh, and again, I, I would ask the question, uh, what does it mean to be saved? Or what does it mean for us to inherit eternal life? You know, people can ask this question for many different reasons. Some people want to make sure that they have all their bases covered. They're doing everything that they need to do um, to, in, to have that salvation. Some people truly may not know. They're, they're, coming to, they're coming to faith. They're coming to Jesus maybe for the first time or in a new way. And they sincerely want to know what, it, what is salvation all about? Some people may ask because they want to feel good about themselves. I'm doing everything I need to do. I have everything covered. So I'm just going to ask to kind of puff myself up and feel good about myself. People ask the question for a lot of reasons. What must I do to be saved was a question that Jesus was asked, and we're going to look at the encounter that Jesus has with this individual. We've been looking at the encounters that Jesus has with people, learning from their story um, how to shape our own hearts and life. And so this encounter, again, is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, beginning at verse 18. A certain ruler asked Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother. All of these I've kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Well, those who heard this asked, well, then who can be saved? And Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said to him, we have left all we had to follow you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. We don't know an awful lot about this man, but we know two things. He was a ruler, probably a religious leader, a synagogue ruler. If he was a synagogue ruler, then it tells us that he was a good man. Everyone saw him. The community saw him as a good man. He followed the rules. He followed the commandments. So when Jesus asked him, have you followed the commandments? Have you, you know, have you not committed adultery? Have you haven't murdered? You haven't steal? You haven't lied? You've honored your parents, and he is confident and able to say, "Yes, I'm a good person. I do good things." So we know he was a good man. The second thing we know is that he was rich. Actually, he was very rich. In Jesus' day, wealth was a sign of God's blessing. And so if you were rich, you were favored by God. God loved you. God welcomed you. If you were very rich, then you really were set apart as one of God's chosen, one of God's children. It's just the way they saw wealth in those days. And so he was very rich and he was good. And so he saw himself as already having 
this gift of eternal life. So why did he ask? He may have asked to test Jesus. He was a synagogue ruler. They loved to challenge Jesus. They loved to test him. So maybe they were asking to test him to see what he would say. Maybe he asked to get patted on the back. So when he says, I've followed all the rules, Jesus, he, Jesus would say, oh, you're so good. You know, good for you. You're amazing. Maybe he was looking for praise and recognition. No matter what his motives were, Jesus turns the tables around and challenges him to dig a little deeper into his faith. Go a little deeper into life. Now, now why this encounter is so important for us to consider, to examine, to look at today is because in so many ways, we are this rich man. We are walking in his shoes. Now, I, I know we may not feel rich. We're not Jeff Bezos rich, you know. At least I don't think any of us are. But compared to three quarters of the world, we're rich. And, and our wealth may not be something that we see as, oh, God has blessed me above others. God has rewarded me for good faith and good behavior. We may not see our wealth that way, but let's not kid ourselves. Our wealth can hinder us from digging deeper in our faith. We'll look at that in a moment. But the other way we're like this man is that most of us see ourselves as being good people. We're good people. Compared to many others, we don't murder, we don't steal, we don't lie much. I mean, we're good, and, and we see ourselves as good, and being good is good. Being good is not what brings us eternal life. Being good is good. I mean, I mean we should be kind and gracious to others, and we should try to follow God, and being good is good, but being good is not what saves us. Being good is not what opens the door to eternal life. This man saw his goodness as kind of buying his way into the kingdom of God. And many times we think that being good is what saves us. Being good is all that's really needed. But salvation does not come from being good. Salvation comes from one place and one place only, and that is Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Salvation and the gift of eternal life does not come through our good deeds. It doesn't come from being a good person. It doesn't come from working hard enough or being good enough. Salvation comes through our faith in Jesus Christ. And even our ability to have faith in Jesus is a gift that comes through God's grace. The Bible is pretty clear. We are all sinners we all fall short of God's glory. We all fail to live that perfect life that would put us into a relationship with God. On our own, we can't live that perfect life. On our own, we can't even turn back to God. On our own, we're kind of like Adam and Eve. We've, we've gone out and done what we wanted to do. We put ourselves in control we became alienated from God. And if God had not gone out and looked for Adam and Eve, if God had not made the initiative to go and find them as they were hiding in the garden, they never would have been found. God's grace is what comes to us in our sin and isolation and brokenness and begins to work in our lives just enough so that maybe we begin to think there's got to be something more. I can't do this on my own. Salvation has to come from someplace else. 
God's grace is what actually begins to turn us back to even think about Jesus or to think about how God's love can work in our lives. It really is God's grace that kind of opens our eyes so that we can see that our salvation is in Christ alone. John Wesley, the found, one of the founders of Methodism, calls this prevenient grace. It's the grace that goes before we even think about turning to God. Before we even consider who Jesus is, maybe I need to dig into that deeper. Before we maybe think about going to church or consider opening the Bible, before we do any of that, it's God working in us that prods us to turn towards him, prevenient grace. God's grace moves in us to turn, to look at Jesus for the fullness of salvation. And salvation comes from the work that Jesus did. Not any work we do, but from the work Jesus did on the cross. On the cross, Jesus took the punishment for sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. The death that Jesus died on the cross it was for your sin, it was for my sin, it was for the sin of the world. He paid the price. And once we just trust that, once we acknowledge that, once we accept and receive that, by grace, you have been saved through faith in Jesus. We don't earn it by being good. We don't deserve it. It's the gift of God. You know, in Jesus' last breath, he said, it is finished. In the Greek, these three words are one word. It's tetelestai, and that word means paid in full. It's actually a word that comes from the business community. When uh, you had a contract with someone, you bought something, they paid for it. When the bill was paid, you would write on it tetelestai, paid in full. Nothing more is needed. So when Jesus says to Telestai, he, he's saying, look, it's paid in full. Nothing more is needed. The work of salvation is done. See, for the rich ruler, he was defining religion with the word do. What does he say? What must I do to inherit eternal life? I have to do something. I have to earn it. I have to pay for it. I've got to do it on my own. What must I do? What rules do I need to follow? How good do I need to be? But Christianity is not spelled do. It is spelled done. The work of Jesus is done. The work of salvation is done. Done once. Done for all. There's nothing more needed. There's nothing more we can add to it. We just need to receive it. It's by grace we have been saved through faith and what Christ Jesus has done for us on the cross. If you want the assurance of salvation today, if you want to know that you have this gift of eternal life, just accept what Jesus has done for us. Accept what he's done for you on the cross. Accept that he alone is the Savior. We don't have any real part in that. We just have to receive it as a, as a gift. Know that he paid the price and that he's open, that, that Christ has opened the door to eternal life. We can have that assurance of salvation. If we're asking ourselves, what do I have to do to be saved? If we still have any doubts or question, we can with confidence say, God, I just am going to place my full faith and trust in Jesus. And what he has done, I can't do anything on my own. But Jesus, you paid the price for my sin. You have redeemed me. You have restored me. You have brought me into a relationship. We are saved by grace through faith. So that we can't boast, it's not by our good works. So now let's go back and look at the other way that we are like this man. We're all rich. Now, he believed that his wealth was a sign of God's blessing, a sign that God had already welcomed him and received him into the kingdom. 
It kept him from going deeper. And that is one of the problems with wealth. Wealth can often be a hindrance to our faith. Our wealth can be a hindrance to our faith. The book of Proverbs shows us that one of the problems with wealth is that it can give us a false sense of security, a false sense of contentment or even pleasure. Having a lot of money can fool us into thinking that we don't even need God. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 8 and 9 says, Give me poverty, give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, Who's the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of God. You see, when we have too much, When we have as much as we need and then some, and all we need for the future, we begin to tell ourselves, I don't know if I really need God. I have everything I need for life. I have everything I need to make me happy. I'm trusting in my bank account, my pension fund, my investments, my salary to meet my needs. I'm trusting in those things instead of really trusting in God. So wealth can hinder our development of a stronger relationship with God. I don't really need God. Wealth can also keep our eyes focused on this world and not on God, not on the things of God, not on how to live out our faith. Because, you see, when we have a lot of money, we start thinking about how to manage it, how to invest it, how to spend it, and how to get more. And it's that last part, how to get more, that really can trip us up. Because no matter how much we have, we always can use a little bit more. It's amazing when studies have done asking people at every single income bracket, how much money do you need to be happy? Almost to a person, they'll say, well, just a little bit more. Think about that. Billionaires. I mean, I don't even know how you spend that much money in your lifetime. But billionaires say, well, if I just had a little bit more... I'd be happy, I'd be content, I'd be secure. So money really becomes kind of that false god, a false idol or or an idol in our lives because we think that we can trust it, but it will never, it will never come through for us. We always need more. See, the key to happiness, the key to security, the key to contentment is not more money, it's not more stuff, it's more Jesus. It's a deeper relationship with God. Jesus tried to get this rich ruler to see this. Notice the, notice the question he asked about the commandments. He said, you shall not, you know, have you followed these commandments? You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. Do you notice, you notice the commandments Jesus doesn't mention? Maybe his omission kind of gets this man thinking. Maybe that was one of the things Jesus was hoping. It's like, well, wait a minute. Why didn't you ask me if I had no other gods? If I honored the Sabbath, if I kept the Lord's name, if I loved the Lord with all my heart and mind and soul and strength. Why didn't why don't you ask me about those, Jesus? Maybe that got him reflecting on his life that really what was missing in his life was a deeper relationship with God. Jesus is trying to help him see that you can't trust in being good. You can't trust in your wealth. You got to trust in me alone. And so he says, go sell everything you have. Don't trust in anything in this world. And then come, what, follow me. Trust in me. Give yourself fully to me. And the man went away sad because he did trust in his wealth. And he didn't want to give it up. And he had a lot of it. As a final warning to his disciples, Jesus talked about the dangers of wealth. He says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into heaven. There's a lot of discussion about, well, what does Jesus mean by a camel going through an eye of a needle? Some people think the eye of a needle was a smaller gate in the larger city gates. During the day, the large gates would be open for all of the traffic to go in and out, the animals, the livestock, the cargo, everything. But at nighttime, to bring security, they would close the gates, and then there'd be a little door that would open, and that way you could control who was coming in and out. 
And some people say that that's what Jesus is talking about, the eye of the needle, this tiny little opening. And the only way you could get a camel through that opening is if you unloaded all of the baggage from that camel, got it to kind of, and I don't know if camels can crawl on their knees. I mean, they kind of go on their knees to, to sit down, but you had to kind of shimmy the camel through. It would be difficult, but not impossible. So is Jesus just saying, well, it's just really difficult for a rich to enter in the kingdom of heaven? He goes on, and, and actually, if we look at the word that he uses for eye of the needle, the needle, it's not having anything to do with gates or doors. It has everything to do with the needle that a tailor would use in sewing. Jesus is talking about a needle. And he can't get a camel through that. No way, no how. And that's the whole point. Jesus is saying, if you try to do it on your own, it's impossible. You try to do it with good works, you're never going to make it. You think you have enough money, to, and, and that's a sign of your, your blessing. You're trusting in the wrong things. But what's impossible for you, Jesus said, is possible with God. And that's the basis of this encounter. Jesus looks at this man and says, look, salvation does not come from being good. It doesn't come from following most of the commandments. It doesn't come because you're wealthy and so you think that God has already blessed you. It comes in only one place and that is by trusting in God. Salvation comes by putting our full faith and trust in Jesus. Faithfulness. It's about having faith and being faithful. That's the key. Faithfulness is what counts. The disciples said to Jesus, we've been faithful. We've given, we've given everything to follow you. And they had. Many of them gave up homes and families and business. Matthew, the tax collector, left his job, never able to go back again. They gave up everything to follow Jesus. And Jesus says, you'll be rewarded Faithfulness is what counts. As I thought about all the disciples gave up to follow Jesus, I had to reflect on what have I given up to follow Jesus? I haven't had to give up my family or friends. In fact, my family and friends wanted me to be a pastor. They wanted me to have faith. I didn't have to give that up. What, what have we had to give up to follow Jesus? Maybe the question we need to ask ourselves is, what do I need to give up today to follow Jesus? What do I need to give up to be faithful? Faithfulness is what counts. What do I need to give up to be faithful? Do we need to give up trusting our money, trusting our wealth? Remind ourselves that we need to give to God first and generously and faithfully, even in difficult and uncertain economic times. Do we need to give up more of our time, our energy, our gifts, our talents, our resources? Do we need to give up some Monday mo or Sunday, uh, uh, some Saturday mornings at home to go and build a home for someone through Habitat for Humanity? What do we need to give up to be faithful? But let me also ask this, what have I gained by being faithful? Many of you have been following Jesus for a long time. What have you gained by being faithful? I've gained a life that's been so much more filled with purpose than anything I could have imagined. I thought having a great career and making a lot of money and being able to travel everywhere was going to was going to bring my life meaning and purpose, and I found it somewhat lacking and empty. Being part of the mission and ministry of God's people, whether that's as a lay person or a staff person or a clergy person, that brings purpose. I've gained family. The church is where I see at times mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, sons, 
and daughters. And, you know, money can't buy that. Faithfulness is what counts. And Jesus said, if you're faithful, you know, if you trust in me, it's not about doing more, but if you're just faithful, you're going to be blessed in this world and then in the world to come. What do we need to give up? But what have we gained? This encounter with Jesus is an important one for us to consider because we are this rich man. His story might be our story. We might be missing it. We might be trusting in the wrong things. We might think we have faith and life and eternal life. And Jesus may be turning to us and saying, you know, you really need to go a little deeper. You need to let go of the things of this world and trust in me and in me alone. Salvation comes by grace through faith so that you can't boast about your good deeds or your wealth. I hope that this man's story in some ways is not our story. He walked away sad. My hope is that we don't walk away. Doesn't mean we have to go and sell everything we have. It does mean we need to surrender everything we have to the the lordship of Jesus, to the control of Jesus, to allow him to lead and guide us in all things. This encounter reminds us salvation is by grace through faith. There's nothing in this world that we should trust in, nothing that we should turn to. We need to surrender what we have to Jesus and then faithfully walk with him in the days to come. I invite you to just surrender yourself and take hold of Jesus. Let us pray. Almighty God, forgive us for the ways that we trust in things that are not you. Forgive us for trusting in ourselves, our wealth, our good deeds. And I pray, God, that you would help us to truly um, let go of all of that so that we could take hold of you. God, I pray that we would truly surrender ourselves uh, to you in this moment so that we might experience the fullness of life. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.